Let me invite you to open your copy of God's Word to our New Testament Scripture lesson this morning. Um, this morning we are in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, looking at verses 11 through 19. Hebrews, chapter 7, verses 11 through 19. I'll ask you to be patient with me this morning. I left my normal Bible in our dining room table, so you got to go with the backup. You know, it's always like trying to write left-handed sometimes. So, let me invite you to give your attention now to the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word, that in its reading we might see Christ. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than the one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priest. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. On the one hand, a, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are a people who are often short on hope. We are a people often far too aware of our failures to obtain perfection. But this does not strike you as new or odd. You know us. You have ordained our days. And you have provided for us. And so, Lord, as we open your word, as we look at how you have spoken to us, with the chaos and the concerns and the cares and the noise of our normal, regular, everyday lives, would they be quieted and stilled that we might meet with you, that we might hear from you, and that this word would bring a better hope. Father, we are thankful that while the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of the Lord stands forever. Amen. The statue of Abraham Lincoln that sits in the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. is an absolutely fascinating sculpture. It was designed and sculpted by Daniel Chester French. And then the work was actually carried out by the Piccarelli brothers. It's 170 tons of white Georgia marble. And French, in sculpting this sculpture, he attempted to capture two attributes of the 16th president. Um, attributes referred to by the, the great uh, biographer Carl Sandburg, one of the preeminent biographers of Abraham Lincoln. He described Lincoln as a man made of steel and velvet. 
was made of steel and velvet. And French portrayed this most vividly in Lincoln's hands. Lincoln's left hand is clenched in a fist. And it is a demonstration of how Lincoln was determined to bring the nation through the Civil War no matter the cost. He knew the cost would be high, both in the lives of those in the North and in the South. But he was determined. His right hand is open and relaxed. When the war was over, Lincoln wanted to see the North and the South brought back together again, but without revenge. Now, perhaps Lincoln's greatness is because, in many ways, he managed to hold both of these facets in tension in his presidency. The author of the letter to Hebrews is displaying two facets of the superiority of Melchizedek. And he's doing this by drawing upon two different texts that highlight and speak about who Melchizedek was. The first we looked at last week when we looked at the narrative in Genesis chapter 14. It laid out some of the basic historical background to Melchizedek. How he was a type of shadow or a type of figure that pointed forward to the Messiah. And so the author was highlighting how many of those inspired silences in Genesis 14 how those point towards a Messiah who is greater by virtue of his divine calling, not a Levitical lineage, who is greater by virtue of his eternality instead of his mortality, who is greater by virtue of the fact that, that Abraham gave a tenth to him and Melchizedek gave a blessing to Abraham. Now, in verses 11 through 19, we get another facet. We get another side, another picture of the superiority of Melchizedek, this time not from Genesis 14, but from David's perspective in Psalm 110. As David was inspired by the Holy Spirit to pen that psalm, he expands on our understanding of Melchizedek's priesthood by speaking of an order of Melchizedek. Previously, there had only been a Levitical order of priest. And now David, a thousand years later, writes in Psalm 10, he speaks of a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. This different order is greater, which by implication means that there were deficiencies or an inferiority of the Levitical priesthood. And it's that implication that the author of Hebrews is seeking to draw out and seeking to explain in this passage. And he's going to go about this by launching into a rhetorical question based on a condition and a result. If this is true, then this would be the result. But we don't see this result, therefore this is not true, and here are the reasons why. He says, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, if this, then why would there be another order, a different order of priesthood? His point is simply this, perfection was not attainable through the Levitical priesthood. Therefore, there would be another order of priesthood, namely the order of Melchizedek. And it's through this better priesthood that perfection is attainable. The author of Hebrews is going to highlight several reasons why this is the case. I've grouped these into three different categories, three different headings, the necessary changes, an indestructible life, and a better hope. He starts off with this idea, now if perfection, what is meant by perfection here in the text? The word used here, teleosis, 
is used in the same base or the root for the word for telos, which is the idea of a goal or an end. And the sense here is the idea of completion or completeness. Now the context for us here in the book of Hebrews is that of the priesthood. And so perfection here means that the priest is able to fully and completely intercede on behalf of the people before God. Perfection means that the priest is is able to fully, finally, and completely able to remove any kind of separation, any kind of obstacle, any kind of sin that stands between a holy God and a sinful people. By this, he means that the wrath of God would be satisfied, the guilt of the people would be removed, and entry into the holy of holies, the very presence of God, would be opened up to everyone. That's what he means by this word perfection. But he says perfection was not obtainable by the Levitical priest. That system could not fully, finally, and completely remove guilt. So, a change was necessary. The author mentions that the people received the law under the priesthood. Well, what does he mean by the law here? I think the law mentioned is referring specifically to the ceremonial law. He says, under it... By it, I think he means the priesthood. By under the priesthood, the people received the law. They received the ceremonial law. The moral law, the Ten Commandments, had already been given to the people prior to the selection of the Levites as priests. But the ceremonial law was still being revealed at that time. Under the priesthood, the people received the ceremonial law. Now, what do I mean when I say ceremonial law as opposed to the moral law? In the scriptures, there are three types of law. There are three different types of law given in the Old Testament. The civil law. The civil law relates to um, the laws for the people of God who are living under a divinely ordained monarch. This is like the historic nation-state of Israel underneath King Solomon or underneath King David. These laws governed how a nation was to wage war, how a nation was to use its land, how a nation was to apply concepts like debt in a just manner. Now these civil laws were types and shadows of what life in a new heavens, in a new earth, would look like under the divine rule of King Jesus. But these laws are not necessarily applicable to those who live outside of God's people under the direct oversight of a divinely ordained monarch. Now the moral law, the second type of law, is the righteous and eternal law of our relationship with God. The moral law predates the civil and the ceremonial law. We see the moral law begin at creation in the garden. When God gives a law to his people, you can eat of any tree in the garden, don't eat of this one. The moral law reflects the very nature, the very character of God's being. It is the standard by which God holds all people accountable. Our confession of faith, the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 19, describes the moral law as a perfect rule of righteousness. Now, the ceremonial law, it related to the rules and regulations of how a people who had violated God's moral law could still live in covenant fellowship with God. These laws relate to things like the forgiveness of sins, justification, atonement. Now, there's clearly overlap with all three types of law, and specifically, the ceremonial law is meant to be a picture of what it means to value, what it means to rightly order the moral law in a person's life. You know, I think the author of Hebrews here is mentioning that this ceremonial law 
is what had been instituted under the priesthood, the Levitical priests. These are the descendants of Levi. They were called to the priesthood for the people because the sons of Levi were the ones who stood on the side of the Lord during the golden calf incident in Exodus chapter 32. Now, because they stood on the side of the Lord, God told Moses, set these people apart, they will be my priest. And then within that tribe, of which Moses and Aaron belonged, within that tribe, those who descended from Aaron would be of a special caliber of priest within the Levites. They would be the ones who would minister directly in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. And the rest of the Levites would assist the Aaronic priesthood. The ceremonial law prescribed what was necessary for a person to be considered clean. The ceremonial law prescribed what was necessary for a priest to be able to offer a right sacrifice. The ceremonial law prescribed what was necessary for us to find atonement. But none of this could perfectly provide what was needed. The ceremonial law was only a sign that pointed to a greater reality. It's helpful here for us to understand the difference between a sign and the thing signified. A sign and the thing signified. If you have ever gone to Disney World... My family loves Disney World. If you've ever gone to Disney World, and unless you arrived by helicopter, which I don't know that any of you have, you arrive on the highway, and as you approach the property of Disney World, across this six or eight lane highway is this massive, colorful, whimsical sign that says, Disney World. And it's got Mickey Mouse, and it's got Donald, and Goofy, and all the others. And when you travel to Orlando, and then you go to Disney World, this sign declares, you made it. Maybe you've been driving from Dallas, and it's been 19 hours, and you made it. And that sign is a relief. But seeing the sign is not the goal. You didn't travel all that way to see a sign. You traveled all that way to see the thing that the sign signified. The sign points to a greater reality, a reality of the the Magic Kingdom and of Epcot and the Animal Kingdom and Hollywood Studios. We like Disney World. Anyone who sees the sign is excited see the sign. And if you're looking forward to seeing the magic kingdom, then you're excited when you see that sign over the highway. But the sign does not complete your trip. It was never designed to complete your trip. Vacation perfection is not attainable through the Disney World sign. The sign is pointing forward to the thing signified. Is pointing forward to a greater reality. The ceremonial law is a sign that is pointing forward to the thing signified. It is pointing forward to the greater reality. Everything in the ceremonial law, the priesthood, the sacrifice, the altar, the temple, the furniture, the cleanliness laws, all of that is a sign that is pointing forward to something different. That's what we see in verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise? The word for another here is the same Greek word for different. If perfection was attainable, then why... Was there a different priest? But the answer to the rhetorical question is that perfection is not attainable. And because of that, a different priest is necessary. The first priesthood wasn't wrong. 
It was just a sign. It was never meant to be the thing signified. It was only meant to point toward the thing that was signified. And the author of Hebrews is trying to highlight this point. He is standing at the sign of Disney World and he's saying, Don't stop. Keep going. There's something better ahead. The priesthood doesn't bring perfection. There is something greater. That something greater is a different priesthood. A priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a a different order of priest. He's not a descendant of Aaron. He's not from the tribe of Levi. He's not even the line of Abraham. He is a different priest after the order of Melchizedek. So he tells us when there's a change in the priesthood... There is necessarily a change in the law. We're talking about the ceremonial law. What changed in the ceremonial law? Well, the author of Hebrews is moving us from the sign to the thing signified. There's nothing wrong with the sign. But the sign was only and always meant to point to something greater. The ceremonial law always pointed toward the greater sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And once you have the greater reality, you don't go back to the sign. You don't go through the turnstiles at the Magic Kingdom, walk down Main Street, USA, take in all of the glory of Cinderella's castle and think, I'd really like to go back to the sign at the highway. We don't go back to the sign because we have the thing signified. The ceremonial law stated that only Levites who had descended from Aaron, could approach the altar. Only they could enter into the inner places of the temple. No one from outside of that tribe was supposed to approach the altar. The few times in Scripture where we see someone outside of that lineage approach the altar are when David or Solomon did so. And those instances are used to highlight the fact that the Levitical priesthood could not deliver. It couldn't bring perfection. Someone else needed to arise. The execution of the ceremonial law, it was limited to Levi. But if the ceremonial law was pointing to something greater, if perfection was supposed to come through a different priesthood, a change in the priesthood, then the fulfillment of the sign was to be found in a change in the priesthood, in a change in the law. David and Solomon, they're from the tribe of Judah. And the future king of God's people was supposed to come from the tribe of Judah. Genesis 49, verse 10, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. It said that Judah's brother bowed down and praise the one who had come from Judah, the king would come from Judah, not Levi. And the prophets spoke of a king who would also hold the office of a priest. The prophets spoke of this king who would sit upon his throne, but who would also do the work of the priest in the temple. And that these two offices would come together in one person. This is where we see the type of Melchizedek, who is the king of Salem, the king of righteousness, the priest of the Most High God. Jesus Christ is from the house of David. He descended from Judah. And while Moses, in the ceremonial law, never talked about someone from Judah being the priest, the change in law, the change in priesthood, which is really a fulfillment of the sign in the thing signified, It leads us to one who would draw all these threads together. All of those threads meet in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the point of your whole Old Testament. 
All of the threads that run throughout your Old Testament terminate in the person of Jesus Christ. The reason everything is in the law, all of the things of the prophets, all of the Psalms, all of the wisdom literature, all of the things that you start to read and you read through the Bible in a year program and you go, ugh, when can I get to something else? All of those are the threads that terminate in Jesus Christ. They all are parts of the signs signifying the greater reality. And when you make that connection, it's when the penny drops. It's when you can look at your whole Bible and go, now I can read all of it. When you make that connection, all of the scriptures begin to open up to where we begin to see the beauty and glory of Jesus Christ from Genesis to Revelation. The author of Hebrews then moves into a second group of reasons. Reasons why the better priesthood is able to offer an attainable perfection. Verse 15. He says, this becomes even more evident. I might be a little offended when I get to this part because that means the previous aspect should have been evident. And, and it takes a lot of study sometimes to get to that point. And he's like, well, this should be even more evident. It's here where he ties in the prophecy of David in Psalm 110. It's here that he begins to transition from the insufficiency of Aaron to the sufficiency of a priest in the likeness of Melchizedek. The qualifications for the Levitical priest were external. You had to be a Levite. Your mother had to be an Israelite. Your father had to be a priest before you. He, you had to have no physical defects. Leviticus 21, verses 16 through 23, lists a number of potential physical defects that would disqualify a man from service. If he was blind in an eye, if he was lame, if he had an injured hand or foot, if he had a skin disease, if he had misshapen arms or legs. Kent Hughes notes that there are 142 disqualifying attributes, blemishes, listed by rabbis. These would all disqualify a Levite from being able to serve. And, and those were all external. And then on top of this, if, <clears throat> if he was qualified, there was a lengthy ordination process. And this involved all sorts of ritual bathings and clothing and anointing with oil and marked with sacrificial blood and various grooming requirements. Again, the focus is external. But the new priest... The priest after the order of Melchizedek had one qualification. And this was internal. He was priest by the power of an indestructible life. Now by this, the scriptures don't mean that this priest would never die. And that was frequently the assumption. And that's why when Jesus was crucified, there was, no, um, there was not an insignificant amount of confusion about his death. However, it meant that though this priest might die, he would rise again in resurrected glory. Jesus is the great high priest on the basis of his resurrection. This is what David meant in Psalm 110, verse 4. David recounts the words of God the Father to God the Son, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Apostle Paul opens up his letter to Romans by talking of the qualifications of Jesus as the Messiah. He says this in verse 4. Romans 1, verse 4. He was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection of from the dead. Jesus intercedes for us today as our great high priest by virtue of his laying down his perfect sacrifice of a life. And then by rising again from the dead and then ascending up into heaven, he eternally serves as our priest. He alone is worthy. In Sunday school, our adult Sunday school class, we've been looking at the attributes and the characters of God. It was phenomenal today. 
And it's phenomenal seeing how doctrine leads us to doxology. And it's the opportunity for us to begin to look and see this. And one of the things we've seen is that these attributes of God all overlap perfectly with one another because God is simple. God has no parts. So when we talk about God's independence, we can apply His independence to all of the attributes He has. When we talk about God's eternality, we see that, that it is simply infinitude applied to His time. That His omniscience is infinitude applied to His knowledge. That His, his, his omnipotence is simply infinity applied to His ability. We talk about all the qualifications of Jesus as high priest. We need to see that He is able to make us perfect because He alone is perfect. He is the one true God who is externally and internally perfect, who is morally and ceremonially perfect, who is completely and wholly perfect. He is the perfect priest. And this means that Jesus then is unique in his ability to intercede on our behalf. He is unique in his understanding of our guilt and our shame. He is unique in his compassion and his sympathy for sinners. He is unique in his ability to answer the sin of our lives. Now maybe you're there, you're thinking, Pastor, you don't know the guilt and shame I feel in my life. You're right. I don't. I might be able to sympathize with you about it. I might not. I'm limited in my ability. I'm limited in my knowledge. I am limited in my compassion. But Jesus is not. He is not limited in these ways. He is our high priest by the power of an indestructible life. The guilt and shame of sin. The crippling anxiety from the fear of failure. The fear of death. The curse of being cut off from God. All of this, Jesus has overcome in His resurrection. And now He stands as our great High Priest the only one who is able to attain perfection for us by the power of His resurrection. This may seem simplistic, and it's probably because it is. Whatever your problem is, Jesus is the answer. We don't look to short-term or nearsighted solutions for answers to our problems. We don't look to a self-help program to solve the problem of our guilt. We don't look to beating and abusing our bodies to atone for the shame we feel. We look to Jesus for the answer. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The third group of reasons why the better priesthood of Melchizedek finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ, why this is better than the Levitical priesthood, why it is able to attain perfection, is because it offers a better hope. The author of Hebrews tells us, look, that old order, the previous order, was weak and useless. The old way couldn't open the door. It's like you traveled 19 hours to Disney World and you got to the gate and then you found out after you passed through the sign, the door's locked. It's not open. You can't get in. There is a constant temptation in our lives to revert to a legalism that we think we can use like a crowbar, and I will pry that door open. 
The original audience for this letter was tempted to revert back to a Jewish legalism of following the law, of following circumcision, of following a ritualism. And if I did these things, then God is obligated to open that door. Do these things and you're worthy. And I've got to be honest, a lot of times I feel good with that. Because I want to be in control. And I want to do it. And I think I will do these things and God has to let me in. Roman Catholics would attempt to force the way open, the way of access by saints. Pray to these various saints and they, they will intercede for you. Let them lobby for you on your behalf. Right? Doesn't it mean that if you want to get near to God, you should get near to those who are near God? Right? They view things kind of like we see our American political system. If you want access to a politician, employ a lobbyist. Work that system until you get your request up to the big guy. And if you are persistent enough, and if you pull all of the right strings, then your request gets heard. We're tempted to do the same thing. We're tempted to have the right type of quiet time. We're tempted to share our faith enough. We're tempted to pursue the right vocation. We're tempted to think, if I don't watch the wrong, the wrong thing, and I only watch the right things, or whatever it is. Those are good things. Don't misunderstand me. But the most dangerous type of legalism is when we make good things into ultimate things. When we think doing the right things will make us righteous. We can't pry the door open. We cannot force it open. We cannot make access to God. We cannot attain perfection by force, even if it's a really great evangelical force. The problem is that we think of access to God in the wrong ways. We think of our access to God in terms of what do I need to do. We need to think, or we think about it in what kind of leverage can I apply. We think about how can I appease God with the right series of good works. And the system does not work. You cannot attain perfection. But what Hebrews tells us is that our access to God is not based on our works. Our access to God is opened by God Himself. When Jesus Christ was crucified, the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the world was torn in two. Through the priestly work of Christ, we have access we don't have to employ a team of lobbyists to make our case on our behalf before the president. We are sons and daughters of the king. We don't have to jump through hoops to get access to God. We come to him like a toddler who's thirsty in the middle of the night. We have that kind of access to God. This gives us a better hope. God is not merely the instrument by which you receive eternal blessing. Our hope is not simply to have more and better stuff. Our hope is not even in having a renewed and a body. Our hope is not in the absence of death, disease, and decay. Our hope is not in any of those good things. But our better hope is this, that we have access and can draw near to God. We can be perfected, by which I mean God will give us full, final, and complete access into the very presence of God. God himself is the blessing that we seek. 
He is the delight that will actually satisfy our hearts. And through the priestly work of Jesus Christ, He will take those who are sinful and separated and guilty and shameful, and He will make them new, and He will open access and invite them in as His very sons and daughters. There's a better hope. The perfection that we seek to attain is found in Jesus. Jesus is better than the sign. Let's pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, in your wisdom, in your grace, in your mercy, you made a better way. You have brought us through Jesus Christ to a better hope. That by his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, you have moved us from the sign to the thing signified. Lord, would you do the work in our hearts that we would make that transition? That we would lay aside the guilt and the shame? That we would lay aside our pride and our arrogance? That we would lay aside all the ways that we think we can open access to you by brute force? And Lord, would we humbly and gladly come to you in Christ. We pray this in his powerful name. Amen.